So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about two different open source um, developer productivity platforms, um, Backstage and, and Coder. Um, for us to give a, a quick intro, um, so I grew up in San Diego, um, currently living in, in Austin, Texas. Um, like you said, I, I work for product at coder.com, um, and I've spent the last five years working for um, various dev tool startups. Um, and, and I really like this conference in particular. Um, my first one was about 10 years ago. I was super nervous. I didn't exactly know what a conference was at the time. Um, and I couldn't get Linux installed on my laptop. Um, so I, I figured this conference was going to be a bunch of people sitting around a table talking about their favorite Linux distribution, um, comparing commands. And I couldn't get Linux installed. So I was absolutely terrified. Um, fortunately, that's not what a conference is. Um, so I went over to the Ubuntu booth, and they helped me get Ubuntu installed on my machine. So um, that's kind of my, my history with scale. Um, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about um, developer productivity. So um, we're going to start with an intro. It's going to start with kind of a mix of both like high-level concepts, and then we're going to get technical into technical solutions um, through the lens of a developer productivity team. Um, I know some folks here are familiar with, with one or both of these tools. Um, we'll get into that, but we're going to start with some kind of 101-style content. Um, so first, what is developer productivity? Um, I am by no means an expert on this topic. I actually think Hans Doctor is. Um, he's written the Developer Productivity Handbook. Um, it's 91 pages. It's quite a page turner. And it really kind of divides developer productivity into two kind of different segments, um, developer productivity engineering and developer productivity management. Um, developer productivity engineering is really optimizing machine processes, such as a, a slow build on a laptop, um, where management is more optimizing people processes, such as Joe's not doing a great job at work today. How can we um, kind of figure, figure that out? Um, so for this talk, I'm going to be sp focusing a little bit more on the developer productivity engineering aspect of things. Um, and through my work in, in DevTools, I've had the opportunity to have conversations with some pretty um, great in engineering leaders. Um, and this is a quote that I've heard from, from several engineering leaders at Fortune 2000 companies. And to me, this is shocking. Um, I would take this with a grain of salt. Um, I, when I try to dig in and ask where does this come from, that developers are only productive 2 to 5% of the time, um, it, they, I, I don't really know what, where this comes from. Um, I, it could be an angry person in C-suite, or it could be a, a very um, kind of methodic, methodologic like survey. I, I really don't know. Um, but what we do know, and this is, this is pretty well known, is that enterprise developers spend 40 to 60% of their work day in their editor. Uh, this is a pretty good number. Um, there's a lot of other things that developers spend their time doing, whether it's um, sprint planning or doing documents or, or code reviews. Um, but this, um, this data comes from the JetBrains survey as well as the, the Slash data survey. Um, and something else the JetBrains survey found is that when, the, when a developer runs into an issue, maybe they're like waiting on a build or their laptop freezes up, they decide just to take a break. Um, so that's a lot of um, kind of time taken out of flow. Um, again, I would take this data as well as a grain of salt. I think it's really important in your organization to run your own surveys and, and understand kind of where are the, the bottlenecks on, on your developer teams. And there's plenty of good templates out there. Um, so now on to the type of productivity teams. Um, and the folks at DX, this is getdx.com. Um, they have a developer productivity platform. They do a really good job segmenting different types of productivity, enablement um, teams. And what I really want to focus on in this talk, too, to get even more specific, is the developer tools teams. Um, these are typically developer infrastructure, platform engineering, um, developer experience, all these kind of sorts of, of names. Um, so these are some common themes that I've gathered, both from analysts as well as practitioners, on kind of what are the best practices when thinking about building a developer tool stack, thinking about what tools do I want to offer engineers that they could consume and, and opt in to use. And the theme that I see very commonly is to adopt a product management mindset. This means um, to really think about who your users are, treat them as customers, and a lot of product management concepts, build a minimum viable product. Um, and, and, and a lot of the, the recommendations, too, that I see is to, to build internal tooling as opposed to buying a platform. Um, 
this is probably a combination of using several different vendors as part of your tooling, but to really own that wrapper, because you really want to own the developer experience, and you also want to own and understand the developer workflow. Um, another kind of fourth point that I see it's pretty important is to provide training and enablement. Um, Team Topologies is a really interesting um, book on this, and it essentially explains that you need to kind of have two separate efforts working in parallel. One is platform, which is kind of maintaining the tools and treating it like a product. And the second is enablement, which is more of a service, which is going to different teams, doing workshops, explaining what tools are. And you have to have both of these things functioning. It could be one team. It could be two teams. But these are kind of the four pillars that I've seen that makes it, um, that, that are really important when you're thinking about building your developer tool stack. Um, and I put as a bonus to use open source software. We're at an open source conference, and um, it's a lot more fun when you can submit a pull request to fix something versus having to wait on a, on a product manager. Um, so today, I'm talking about Backstage Encoder. These are two separate categories. Um, there's the internal developer platform, IDP and Cloud Developer Environments, CDE. And it's kind of a tongue twister. Um, you use your IDP to connect to your CDE, and then you use an IDE. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of terms here. Um, so before we get into to backstage and, and internal developer platforms, I wanted to explain the services problem. Uh, many folks here might be familiar with this, um, but it boils down to many software applications start very small. Um, they get larger difficult to manage at a large team. Um, they're ultimately split from monolith into microservices. This creates a lot of benefits. It allows teams to contribute with each other. It allows these services to talk to each other with a common API. Um, and more services are created. They grow in size. Some get orphaned. They no longer have owners. And it becomes extremely difficult to manage. And this visualization covers the scale and quantity of services, but it also doesn't cover the complexity that comes with different dependencies talking to each other and, and hierarchy, meaning um, this service sits on top of this one. And it becomes, when you're doing a request, this giant chain down services, and it's very difficult to understand what's going on. So now imagine one of these services stop responding, or you look, need to upgrade a dependency, and you don't really understand how it's going to impact the rest of the stack. Um, so this was the problem that Spotify was constantly running into. Um, and instead of building and testing code, teams were spending more and more time looking just for the right information to get started. Um, so the thing that they did first and foremost was they built a service catalog. Um, and a service catalog was one of the first things that Spotify built when they were creating Backstage in 2020. And it essentially splits these services into separate components. It makes it pretty easy to track um, a specific um, item in the component, and you can see metadata inside there, such as the team, SLAs, and the different hierarchy and dependencies that these services rely on. Um, it's pretty easy to query. Um, you can read the metadata inside a specific service, API documentation, CI pipelines. Um, it's relatively easy to kind of track what's going on in, in Backstage. So this is what Backstage itself looks like. It was originally launched by Spotify in, in March of 2020 as an engineering blog post. In 2022, I believe, they donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And um, it comes with a service catalog, which I talked about. It comes with a pretty cool tool called the, product, the Project Scaffolder. Um, include, and then they also just have a plugin ecosystem that really allows you to extend um, Backstage for your own uses. Um, so this is a scaffolder. It's kind of like Git fork on steroids, meaning you kind of pick a template, whether it's like React, for example. Um, give it some details, and it'll fork your repo, and then also set up an arbitrary number of um, steps as you go. Um, another important thing to mention is that Backstage is a framework. It's not a platform, meaning you'll need people with React experience when you're creating um, plugins and extensions for this. Um, it's kind of like a Create React app for developer portals. So what you're looking at here, it's called Runway. And it's American Airlines version of Backstage. They do a lot of presentations on it. It's really cool. And you'll see that it's very differently skinned than what the Spotify Backstage looks like. Um, again, just to emphasize that Backstage is a framework, not a platform. This is a documentation on how to add um, OIDC-based sign-in into the application. It's not setting some YAML. It's actually importing a React component and then placing it into your application. 
And again, Backstage is a framework, not a platform. Um, this is the plugin store on Backstage. Um, not only can you consume plugins from the community, but if you want to extend Backstage, the main way of doing so is through these plugins. Um, a big thing that I've seen talking to organizations that use Backstage is they really promote something called InnerSource, which is engineers contributing up to the platform team to either add a plugin for their specific team or make a change to um, an existing plugin that they'd like to see. So on to kind of how organizations are actually using Backstage. Uh, this comes from conversations I've had with, with dozens of different um, Backstage users in, in various stages. And um, what I've seen for a good Backstage deployment is that there's a small focused core team that, that manages this. This typically involves one product person, again, who's thinking who are our customers, what's the MVP, what's on our roadmap, what rabbit holes will we kind of save for, for another day, as well as an engineer with, with React experience, someone with infrastructure experience. Um, that's kind of the three that you would need. That could be one person if, if the, this person's a jack of all trades, but really I've seen that Backstage teams are about six to 10 people. Um, the, the thing also that really makes a good backstage appointment is important services are actually being cataloged. It's a service catalog, but if a, a critical application goes down and it's not in backstage, it's probably not um, a, a fully mature backstage deployment at that point. Um, third thing, back, uh, plugins are added based on need. Again, this kind of goes back to the, um, the product mindset. You really have to survey and, and understand your engineers. Maybe if you came from a, a, the engineering org, it might be a little bit easier, but you, you really want to be able to add plugins that save time for developers. Some plugins I've seen work really well are infrastructure provisioning ones, maybe one that would give each developer a, a namespace, for example, or replace kind of a, a service catalog. So I've seen people using Backstage to request a new laptop, um, for example. Um, and then the, the fourth uh, is, is, is kind of, I should have added an asterisk here, developers use it daily. Um, I think it should more just go to developers use it. Again, if you create something and you don't have metrics on whether people are using it or not or you don't hear about it much, it's probably not super successful. Um, Expedia has a really cool blog post on, on the Backstage blog talking about how their engineers use it. And one of their metrics said that 4,000 developers use it for over 20 minutes a day. So that's, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and on this kind of fourth point as well, Backstage has a Discord, and there's a channel in the Discord called Adoption, and it's kind of for organizations who struggle kind of getting, getting adoption on, onto one of these projects. Um, onto a great Backstage deployment, though, and this one is going to be things that are, are significantly more tricky, and significantly fewer organizations have been able to reach this, at least from the, the conversations I've had. Um, uh, first, this leadership gets it. Uh, I, I think this is really important. American Airlines talks about this a lot. They actually had an organization-wide OKR around inner source contributions and, and, being, and making sure that everything's cataloged in this portal. And again, I think if that's really to have leadership buy-in, it makes these projects significantly more successful. Um, the second is data-driven metrics. The, the third is um, true self-service provisioning. So Backstage can catalog what's already exists out there, but if you can't provide a golden path for developers, and this is a very common term in, in platform engineering, right? Like a golden path um, for when a developer needs to create a new service, then all you can kind of do is wrangle all the various services out there and try to consolidate it, as opposed to creating a path forward for people to create new things using Backstage. Um, and the fourth, this seems to be a very popular metric for teams managing Backstage, which is contributions. Um, this could either be people contributing to Backstage plugins or people using Backstage to discover other areas in the, the business that they can contribute to outside of their kind of core function. I, I broke this into stages too. Um, the first stage is install and customize. Uh, and again, I think this is a good opportunity to bring in this, this product mindset. Really to, I think it's really easy to kind of get stuck in this phase and get the theming just right to align with the company brand guidelines or to create a plugin for a very specific use case where um, I think it, it's easy to go down rabbit holes before actually rolling it out to your users and um, using it. Um, the second is to catalog the status quo. Um, a lot of organizations talk to me about how many services they have cataloged in Backstage and I actually don't think that's a, a good metric. I think it's more kind of important to understand what like kind of important services are cataloged as opposed to like the percentage of total services. Um, if someone's like, we have 300 services in Backstage, um, again, if, if a critical production facing app isn't there, then um, it's probably not a complete um, like snapshot of your service. Um, 
And then the third is a developer's toolbox. And this is essentially relying on the flexibility of Backstage to be able to add different plugins and um, tools into Backstage to help developers with other parts of their workflow, whether it's CI pipelines or infrastructure provisioning or kind of keeping track of, of other tools in Backstage. Again, Backstage is essentially the Create React app for developer portals. So the platform team can really add anything in that, that needs automation um, for developer productivity. So um, this is data from an independent survey from Slash Data, and it essentially covers the average time spent um, by software engineers in, in their day. Um, and Backstage does a really great job at um, covering many of these. These are the things in the software development lifecycle around planning, maybe making sure that something's deployed is being successfully monitored, um, making sure deployments run successfully, operating prod code, as well as kind of having the proper security scans uh, visualized in Backstage. However, you'll notice what's missing is where developers actually spend the majority of their time. Um, developers spend the majority of their time in their editor, whether it's setting up their dev tools, writing code, um, or even managing code. So that's kind of where Coder comes in. Um, imagine you are a developer, you work in this organization with a bunch of services, and you want to make a contribution. How would you actually get that environment set up to do so? Um, so that's where Coder comes in. It's an open source platform for cloud developer environments. Um, it, it helps, we see people using it for several use cases. Um, the first is faster onboarding, meaning it takes on average about a week for developers to get their environment set up. If it's completely automated away, it could go down to, down to like an hour. Um, the second is consistent environments. Um, this is pretty important if you have a complex microservice mesh and if you're running code on your laptop, you will have to modify or mock a lot of the data that you would typically be running in a data center on your laptop to get things working. Um, when you're creating a remote environment, you're able to kind of give developers a full environment that has production parity. Uh, the third is to be able to secure your source code. And, and this is important for a lot of customers that run in, in regulated environments where source code can't run on laptops or it has to be severely audited and laptops are bogged down, making it very difficult for developers to um, get their work done. So what we see really is people will download and use our, our, our project for kind of some combination of, of two or three of these things. Uh, Coder has two main features. The first is templates. These are essentially blueprints for workspaces. Uh, they're written in Terraform, or this is an open source conference, so open tofu. And you can essentially write any resource in Terraform as a template. So you could give each developer a pod, or you could give each developer a, a VM. Um, and again, this can run in, in any um, like on-prem or, or cloud environment. Uh, the second is workspaces. And, and these are individual environments for each developer. This is the kind of coder UI on the left here. And the developer is able to pick a project and um, set those, those values. And you are able to do things like Vim and Emacs as well. So this is actually what the, the coder workflow looks like. I think the term environment gets conflated a bit. This on the right is VS Code. And on the left is the coder UI. And you'll notice in VS Code, um, if you're sitting close to the screen, that it's a, it's a Linux terminal, and the file system is remote to that of my laptop. So essentially, I'm able to provision this remote container running, um, click the VS Code desktop button, and, and get in. And it already has my repo cloned, and it also has my project set up. So kind of back on to the, the good and the great. Um, a good coder deployment is very similar to the kind of attributes of a, of a good backstage deployment. Um, the first is a small focused core team. You don't necessarily need people with um, software development experience, but you do need people with infrastructure experience. So you'll need someone who knows Terraform. You'll need someone who understands cloud infrastructure. And you'll also want someone with that kind of product management mindset. Again, it could be one of those two people, but it's someone thinking, who are our target users? How do we want to use this platform? Um, and, and a good coder deployment, is similar to a backstage deployment, is great for spinning up a new project. And it also has patterns in place for people who want to bring a project that they're doing locally into Coder for a, for a faster or more secure experience. Um, again, for a great coder deployment, I think it's really important that the leadership gets it. They understand the value props. It's significantly easier to kind of justify things like this if um, if there's, there's buy-in from above. Um, uh, another good attribute is it's integrated with a golden path. So if you're trying to promote, for example, DevOps or, or cloud development or um, 
an existing kind of pattern in, in your organization with, with backstage or self-service, it's, it's pretty great to be able to incorporate Coder into this existing story. Um, and, and the third point, which I'll talk about a little bit, is teams can bring their own dependencies. For example, I need to use Python 3, Java 11, and um, Ruby, for example, into Coder, and Coder knows what to do with it and, and builds it. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's, that's possible down the road. Uh, so to break Coder kind of into three different stages, uh, the first stage we typically see our users doing is these sandbox environments. These are environments that come with a bunch of tools pre-baked in it. Someone can click a button, get a workspace, and start tinkering with Docker or React or Terraform. Um, but it might not necessarily be ready for their actual day-to-day -day projects. Uh, the second stage is, is developer teams. And this is essentially kind of done in part with the sandbox environments. You deploy sandbox environments, people say, hey, I'd, I'd love to use this for this project, and then you kind of do this, this enablement model to help get um, Coder kind of configured for that. And, and then the third kind of stage is this bring your own tools approach, where engineers can go into the platform, they can say, I need these specific languages in it. Um, it'll be downloaded from a, a secure artifact store, it doesn't have to be downloaded from the, the internet, um, and developers can kind of develop that way. So going back to this chart, um, we know now that um, oh, interesting. We know now that Coder or Backstage makes a great internal developer platform. Coder makes a great CDE, and um, now let me just go ahead and give a demo. So to integrate um, Coder kind of into your backstage golden path, we have an open source repo. It's just on, um, I'll share the link after. And um, like most things in backstage, you have to do some coding to get it imported in. It's relatively easy. You add the package um, and add a few kind of lines in. So here I have a deployment running. And this is a relatively standard backstage deployment. The only plugins that I have are the, the coder plugins. Um, and you'll notice this looks like a pretty normal backstage plugin. It has automatically detected, though, that this project is compatible with dev containers. And, and I'll explain why it's a little bit important later. And the, the other thing our plugin adds is this coder workspaces panel on the right. From here, I can create a workspace takes me directly into the Coder platform, and what it does is it starts building a project in Coder based on the specs in my Git repo. I, um, I have one running here. This is the, the same project, and I can click one button, VS Code Desktop. It'll open my desktop editor and create a tunnel over SSH into the workspace. You'll notice it's automatically cloned the repo. If I go into the terminal, and I can make this a little bigger. It has Python installed. If I needed Node, I believe the image has Node as well. Oh, I think it has Yarn. Yep, it has Yarn as well. And I can start my project. So I'll go into the project. Yarn dev, Oop. flask run, it's a Python project. And get in and, and start coding. So I did not have to set up any tools on my local machine besides having VS Code running. And I'm able to connect remotely into this workspace and start working on a project. Uh, just to kind of prove this is a remote workspace, this is a, through the coder extension. It's showing me that I'm connected peer to peer to the, to the workspace. If I just run a uname as well, I'm in a Linux environment as well. Uh, another thing Coder offers is a, um, a web-based experience as well. So technically, someone could connect through a Chromebook or an iPad. The Chromebook experience is pretty good. The iPad is it's all right. Um, and through the web browser, the person can get the same VS Code experience with their repo cloned um, and can be ready to go. If I go back into Backstage, um, 
it has detected this workspace, and if I wanted to create another one, perhaps for a second environment or I'm working on a new project, I can just hit this here, and it spins up another one of these cloud environments. The other plugin I wanted to show is if you didn't want to use Coder at all, but you still kind of wanted this magical one click into a, into a project. Um, without something like this, it's typically a contributing.md or some wiki where it's 10 to 30 steps on how to set up a project for an engineer. Um, it probably only works on one operating system, meaning if you begin supporting, um, maybe you moved from Intel to M1, it would be a whole new set of instructions. If you moved, if you had a developer using Linux or Windows, it would be a totally different set of instructions. Um, so again, th there are a lot of benefits to having this instant kind of containerized dev environment experience. Um, and if you didn't want to use Coder, we created a plugin as well that uses the dev container spec. Um, to talk a little bit more about the dev container spec, um, I'll actually go into the repo. There's a dev container folder here. And in the dev container folder, there's both a dev container.json and a Docker file. Uh, the dev container spec is not something that we came up with. It's not something Backstage came up with. It actually, I believe, was created by Microsoft. Um, and they have a local extension for it as well. And it's also in, in code spaces. Um, but it's essentially explaining kind of what tools I need for this project so that each developer doesn't have to run one of these. Uh, it starts from the Python's base image. It'll install the, the editor. And it's also installing two pip packages. Um, so this is quite a simple example, but you can imagine for more complex projects, um, the dev container spec can still scale and install multiple languages, multiple tools. It's essentially a, a Docker file. Um, the dev container spec also has support for something called features. I don't believe I'm using any of those now. Um, but features can be used to install kind of sidecar processes and then mount them into, into Coder. Um, because it detected it has a dev container spec, I have this open in VS Code local button. And what this does is it takes me again to VS Code, um, gives me a pop-up, and it's using the dev containers VS Code extension to actually run the same exact um, kind of environment locally. So let's see. Let's close this out and do that again. So we can see now it's no longer using the coder extension, it's using a dev container extension. But again, if I run uname, it's a Linux environment. I have Python installed. Oop. And I can do my development this way as well. So both of these plugins are open source. Um, you can install them into your backstage deployment today. And um, it's a great way to kind of add these extra steps to your workflow. Um, re really solves tools the, the problem of developer setup. Uh, let's go back to slides. Cool. Um, so yeah, with that, you can use Backstage as an internal developer platform. Um, Coder is a cloud developer environment. And there's kind of a lot of things that these tools do differently. Um, but there's a lot of kind of concepts that they solve together, um, which are kind of around onboarding, context switching, and provisioning environments. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. I think there's plenty of time for questions. And um, the QR code takes you to our Backstage Plugins repo if you wanted to download or check out one of these, one of these plugins. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for such a great presentation.